um, to the last week here. So let me share my screen. And you'll see that the title of today's lecture is Quadratic Forms Over the Integers. So we're going to be starting a new topic today. But first, <laughs> we have to finish up uh, our discussion from last time. So we're going to finish the proof of Hasse Minkowski. And then we'll wipe the slate clean and kind of start afresh with a new sort of theme of quadratic forms over Z. Um, well, so let me recall what we were in the middle of doing. Uh, so the, the statement of Hasse Minkowski is that F, if F is a, a quadratic form over Q such that F nu is uh, isotropic, uh, for all places mu of Q, then F is isotropic. So if you've got a non-trivial zero in the p-addicts for all primes p and in the real numbers, then you've got a non-trivial zero in the rational numbers. And so we just saw that this was true uh, for n, the number of variables less than or equal to three. And um, <clears throat> today we're going to do n equals four. And then finally, we'll have enough uh, raw starting power to be able to do an induction, uh, allowing us to establish the case uh, n greater than or equal to five. Um, okay. And I just, before we get going on this, I just want to remind you of a small lemma we had um, from last time that we didn't actually use last time because it was actually only supposed to be used in the n equals four case. Um, so, if, so if you have a and b and q for any mu, any place mu, if you have a, b and q nu cross, and also, well, also c and q nu cross, but playing a different role, uh, then the form ax squared plus by squared represents c if and only if there's a certain equality of Hilbert symbols. So if and only if a b mu is the same thing as c comma minus a b mu. Okay, the precise form of it doesn't matter. The important thing is just that it's some, some relation between Hilbert symbol evaluated on c and that on a and b. Um, so we proved that last time. I won't, I won't go over it again. And now let me uh, explain the case n equals four. So, so the proof of Hasse Minkowski for n equals four. So we're gonna, as usual, write our quadratic form in diagonal form. So we'll take f to be um, ax squared plus dy squared plus cz squared plus dw squared. Now, in the previous lecture, we said we can do a number of reductions. We can make a whatever we want, and then we can make b, c, and d square free integers, but none of those reduct none of that is going to be important for this argument. So you can just have all of these be non-zero rational numbers. Uh, further assumptions on them will not be relevant. So I won't use them. Um, okay. Now what is the idea? The idea is we're going to split it up into in, in two. So actually I'd rather write it I'd rather change signs for the purposes of the argument. So I'm actually going to write it as I'm going to change what C and D are. Uh, I'm actually going to write it as a difference of two quadratic forms and two variables instead. Um, and that's just, it's just going to make the notation a little simpler. So, so for all new, we have that F new represents zero. Um, so we have, we can solve for this expression being equal to zero, which means we can solve for AX squared plus BY squared equal to CZ squared plus DW squared. Um, and that tells us we, that we can find a, a scalar uh, t nu in q nu such that ax squared plus by squared represents t nu, and so does uh, and so does cx squared plus dy uh, dy squared. Or well, it does, I guess maybe I should use the same variables. Plus uh, cz squared plus dw squared also represents t nu. So 
what this hypothesis that our four variable quadratic form represents gives us is that uh, when we split it up into two, then uh, the first half, we have a number which is represented by both the first half and the second half, so to speak. Um, now, let me make a small remark. Uh, we can assume that TV is non-zero. So TV is in Q nu cross. Um, why is that? Well, suppose it were zero, then this form would represent zero. Therefore, it would be isotropic. Therefore, it would represent everything. There was this lemma we've, we've had and used several times. Um, so in fact, it would be the hyperbolic plane and the hyperbolic plane represents everything. And similarly, this one would represent everything. So then we could just choose any random non-zero scalar and it'll be represented by both. So we could just replace T nu by that random scalar. Um, so there would be no problem. So we can indeed assume uh, that, that it's non-zero. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah. So F sub nu, that's just the original F when you take it, but why are you now saying that, so it's AX squared plus BY squared minus CZ squared minus DW squared that represents F nu. Yes, so there's, there's a bit of an abuse here, okay? So when I say F nu, I mean F, the same you know, quadratic function, right? But viewed now as a function on Q nu instead of just as a function on Q. So, so it's the same f you could say, but when, but the, but the statement f nu represents zero means something different. Now it means that there are uh, elements x, y, z, and w in q nu such that the value is equal to zero. So, right, but you are omitting some of the summons in f nu when you say that cx squared plus by squared represents f nu, or ax. Well, this representing zero is the same thing as saying ax squared plus by squared equals cz squared plus dw squared, right? But that's not the fw, uh, that's not fv. No. That's not f. No. So f is that four polynomial with four terms, right? Yes, this one. So right f here. nu also has four terms, but now you're just cutting uh, f nu in, in half some. Yeah. So I haven't given names to these forms. Oh, um, are you calling the T? Or is that? No, no, T is, T is a scalar, yeah? So T is some scalar that we know exists just because we can take the value on AX squared plus BY squared, call that T nu. I mean, for our zero, we have the zero of F nu. Okay, sorry. I thought that T nu is F nu. Ah, uh, yes, 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 yes. So, um, uh, there's a, a reflection that takes one to the other on the piece of paper, but they are uh, in, in the way I write them, but they are, uh, they are different, yeah. Could you make it clear, please, for somebody who walks in later? Ah, I see what you mean now that I'm looking at it myself. Yeah, it does not look clear at all. Okay, you know what? Let me see what I can do with making my form a capital F instead. And I hope I remember, if I don't, if I don't remember, please remind me. So our form is going to be capital F. Thanks for pointing that out, Irina. Yeah, I didn't realize that looked so confusing. Yes. Um, right. So we can assume T nu is in uh, Q nu cross. Um, and now by the lemma that we just re recalled here, this computation with Hilbert symbols, um, well, this is equivalent to saying that uh, you know, some of the quality of Hilbert symbols, T mu uh, minus AB equals uh, AB. And this is all at mu. And uh, similarly here, T mu minus CD equals C comma D mu. Okay. Um, now, we're going to use weak approximation. We want to turn, want to replace the T mu by the same T in Q cross, say. So we, all these T mu's are depend on mu a priori, right? But we want to say that we can replace them by something which doesn't depend on you. And in fact, you know, comes from Q. Um, and we'll do that using weak approximation. In a certain clever way. So the statements from your problem sets about uh, that, that's exactly a way of going from a bunch of local data to um, some global data. 
some local, some local scalars to some global scalars. Um, but to apply weak approximation, you have to have a finite set of primes at which you're operating. So you somehow have to be able to control everything that's happening outside of that finite set of primes. So what is our finite set of primes going to be? It's going to be the, the least obvious, I mean, the, the, the primes that for which the behavior, at which the behavior of the quadratic form is hardest to control. Um, so let S uh, be the set of places, which is infinity and two. Those are always tricky, right? Those are kind of exceptional cases in the theory of quadratic forms. Uh, the real numbers in Q2. So we'll always stick those in. And then we union uh, the set of primes P for which P divides either A or B or C or D. So we just look at all the primes that are going to cause us trouble, um, potentially, and we make that uh, our finite set. Um, all right. Uh, yes, Eleftherius. And I mean, can we say that for all the other primes that we haven't included in S, this uh, uh, four-dimensional form that we started with is going to be isotropic in, in Q nu, right? No. Yes. Isn't it? Yeah, okay. that's not that's not exactly. We're going to use that, but we're going to use that observation, that kind of trick more in the n greater than or equal to 5 case. Um, that's not actually going to help us with this precise um, this precise argument here. Um, we've transferred everything to being represented by quadratic forms in two variables. And, um, yeah, but no, well, actually, we'll use a form of that uh, pretty soon. Okay, so uh, now let's apply weak approximation from your problem set. And that tells you there exists a T in Q um, as close as you want. Uh, to T nu for all nu and S. So meaning there's a, a rational number T um, and you can choose the rational number such that the distance between t and t nu in the mu absolute value is as small as you like. Um, or uh, this, is, this is equivalent to saying that the distance between t over t nu and one uh, is uh, as small as you like. Well, you have to fix how small you want it to be and then you can make it that, um, that small. And this means that you can guarantee that t over t nu is a square. Because the first problem on the problem set said that if you're, you're close enough to one in any of these local fields, um, then you're a square. Uh, so, and that's all we're gonna take out of this is a, a t and q cross such that at all the exceptional places, t differs from t nu multiplicatively by a square. Um, and what does this tell us? Well, the, the Hilbert symbol, recall, is bimultiplicative um, and it takes values in plus or minus one. So if, if you replace anything in the Hilbert symbol by something which differs for, from it by a square, then it doesn't change the value. So that means that, uh, for, so that t comma a b nu uh, is equal to t nu comma a, oh, minus a b, I should put nu, which by a hypothesis is equal to a b nu. Um, and that tells us that T is represented by, uh, by uh, AX, oops, plus BY squared. And similarly, also by CX squared plus BY squared. Okay. Uh, I'm, and, the, and this should be, sorry, uh, and this, I should, now I should be really careful because everything here is a rational number. So I mean in Q nu. So it's represented in Q nu by AX squared plus BY squared, meaning you can find X and Y in Q nu such that T equals AX squared plus BY squared. Um, so we've guaranteed that uh, our number T is represented by AX squared plus BY squared in Q nu for these exceptional places nu, but what about all the other ones? We have to be able to control those as well. Um, and for this, we actually need an extra hypothesis on T. So, so recall the variant of weak approximation that says that uh, we can also, this was proved, this was also on the problem set. Um, so we were allowed to guarantee that uh, the new attic absolute value, well, the P attic absolute value of T is less than or equal to one for all P that are not in S um, with possibly one exception, which we'll call P naught. 
Um, so you can you can make it p integral at all p except for one where you, where you will have to you have to have some kind of denominators. Um, okay. Uh, then for uh, p not in S uh, union p not, uh, we have that uh, t comma minus a b p is also equal to one. Because we're at an odd prime, all of our except we put two as our one of our exceptional primes, so we're at an odd prime, and everything here is relatively prime to p. Um, oh, sorry, I shouldn't. Yeah, uh, no, sorry, I should have actually said. Um, oh, I should have actually said maybe maybe I stated it wrong in the problem set. I want to guarantee that it's a a p-adic unit, not just absolute. I, I should have said uh, you can guarantee. I might have stated it wrong in the problem set. You, you can prove something stronger. Um, yeah, uh, right. You want to actually guarantee that the p-adic absolute value is equal to one, so it's a p-adic unit. Um, but then the Hilbert symbol is equal to one, but that's also the same thing as the Hilbert symbol of a, b, p. So all of these are p-adic units as well. Um, so we have the same conclusion anyway. So p is also represented by ax squared plus by squared in these qps. So the only place left for which we don't know that T is represented by our guys uh, is P naught. Um, but that, that's only one place. And by Hilbert's product formula, we must also have that T minus AB P naught is equal to AB P naught. Because Hilbert's product formula says that if you know, a, a, you know, if, you have, if you're taking a Hilbert symbols where the values are in Q, um, and you know that you know them for all but one place, then you know them for the remaining place because it's determined because it has to be equal to the product of the rest, and that's true for this side of the equation, and that's also true for this side of the equation. Um, so here's where we're using Hilbert's product formula or quadratic reciprocity in a kind of surprising way. Um, so we see that also at the place p naught we have the same conclusion. So our, our grand conclusion is that t is represented by ax squared plus by squared and cz squared plus dw uh, squared uh, for all places uh, nu. So in represented in q nu. But being represented by a two variable, variable quadratic form is the same thing as saying that the three variable quadratic form you get by you know, so a b minus t nu is isotropic for all nu, and so is c d minus t nu. And then by sort of doing a little bit of an induction here, so by the three variable case, uh, we deduce that a b minus t is isotropic. Uh, and so is uh, C D minus T. Sorry, I'm, I'm fitting that in a very small corner there. Let me instead move on to the next page. Um, so this implies that uh, by the three variable case that A B minus T and C D minus T are isotropic over Q. And that again tells us that you have uh, you know you have x y z w such that a x squared plus b y squared equals t and c x squared plus d uh, z squared equals t. So that means these two things are equal to each other. And you bring it over to the other side, and you've um, you've uh, solved your equation. So that's the um, the four variable case. Um, okay. So now, um, collect my notes here. Um, uh, just a sec. Go 
have lost my place. So. Okay. Um, so let's move on to the five or more variable case. So. so I'll just write it in five variables just to just for concreteness, but the, you'll see that the argument is inductive and it will work for any n greater than or equal to five. So let's just say n equals five. Then we have f equals, um, no, we'll use the same, well, we'll start in a similar way. Uh, uh, oh no. Uh, um, actually, let me, let me do A1 and B1 and C1. So we have uh, AX squared plus BY squared minus A1Z squared minus B1W squared minus C1V squared. Um, and we're going to do a slightly different argument here. Um, so yeah, it's not going to be obvious why I'm making this my finite set right now, but it'll come through in the, in the argument. Um, so we're going to do another weak approximation, um, but it'll suffice to use the naive form of weak approximation in this case. It's supposed to, everything's supposed to become easier when you add more variables, right? That's this, this principle of the new, the U invariant um, that Akhil talked about that, you know, eventually over most fields, if you add enough variables, then you're supposed to always have a zero. So, and in particular, I just want to make a remark here. We saw that over a p-adic field, as soon as you have five variables, you're guaranteed to have a zero. So our hypothesis is almost vacuous. Uh, our hypothesis in Hassan Minkowski that the form is isotropic at all places is almost vacuous. I say almost because at the real numbers, it's still saying something. Um, it's saying that you're isotropic over the real numbers. But that's sort of all we should need to use. Now, in fact, in the argument, we're going to use more than that. But this is just to show you that things are supposed to, the argument is a little easier than the n equals four case. It's supposed to be a little bit easier to find zeros um, the more variables you have. And that makes sense. Um, okay, so we're going to let S be the set of places um, uh, where uh, A, uh, yeah, this A1, uh, B1, uh, C1 is not isotropic. And this is finite. Um, because for large enough primes, you know, for primes P not dividing uh, two A1, B1, C1, um, you have a non-trivial zero in FP by the mu inver by U invariant. Well, that was this, this counting argument that Akhil gave that a quadratic form in three variables over FP um, always has a non-trivial zero. And then you get one even in ZP by, uh, by um, what's it called, the uh, Hensel's lemma. Um, and therefore also in QP. And this is where we're using the hypothesis that N is greater than or equal to five, by the way. It's that when you split it up into two variables and then the remainder of the variables that you have at least three variables left over. So that you can make this are exactly this argument here that the set of places that you're um, looking at is finite. Okay. Um, so now, uh, so for new, so we to to make a weak approximation argument, we need a scalar. Um, uh, so um, yeah, just a sec, uh, let me get my notes up. But I'm gonna get a little lost otherwise in my argument here. Um, yeah. uh, right. Um, right, so we're again just gonna, uh, we're gonna choose a random value, uh, T mu uh, of uh, AX squared plus BY squared. Um, 
So let's say uh, uh, yeah. ax nu squared plus by nu squared uh, equals t nu uh, for nu and s. And all of these, you know, and x nu and y nu and t nu uh, are all going to be in q nu. Um, and again, we can assume, uh, yeah, we can assume t nu is in, well, we can assume they're all in uh, q nu cross, actually. Um, I don't want to give the little argument for why, but, uh, oh, no, wait, uh, wait, no, maybe I don't need that because I'm, no, I'm not using the, I'm using the naive form of weak approximation. Uh, no, maybe I do need it. Oh, sorry, guys, I'm a little confused right now. Let's just put it in, uh, right. Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to apply weak approximation not to t nu directly, but to the x nu's and the and the and the y nu's, which is actually stronger, because if we're close to x nu and y nu, then we're also close to t nu just because of this algebraic expression and continuity of the um, the algebraic operations. So we'll choose uh, x y in Q cross close enough uh, to x nu y nu so that. Uh, again, uh, x is in x nu up to square, I mean, x is equal to x nu up to squares uh, for all nu, and same with y. Um, right. Um, and this implies, as I said, by continuity that, uh, that uh, t is also in well we, can, well, we can choose it also close enough uh, so that by continuity, we're implied that T is close enough to TP, uh, sorry, T nu. And in particular, it's, uh, it's, it's a scalar, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a square off from T nu. Okay. Um, so, um, so now we already have that T is represented over, so that in, in, in Q nu, T is represented um, by rational numbers x and y. So now we just have to control the other half of the expression. We also want t to be represented by the other variables that we left out. Um, so, um, uh, right. So, but so, yeah, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, Ah, okay. I, I I didn't I didn't make it precise enough. I'm sorry. Um, I don't want to choose a random value of a x squared plus b y squared. I want to choose a um, yeah. I want to choose it just like in the previous one, so that this is equal to uh, a one uh, z nu squared plus b one w nu squared plus uh, c one uh, v nu squared. So I want to choose rather a zero of my quadratic form over q nu. And let t nu be the thing that's equal to the, you know, both of the halves, since I put a minus sign on. So we're doing it just like in the previous lemma. I'm sorry for getting confused about this. Um, so then the fact that t differs from t nu by a square implies that uh, t, uh, t is, you know, so t nu is represented by the other half of my quadratic form. And there, since t differs by t nu by a square, then t is also represented, or in other words, t comma a1, B1, uh, C1 is isotropic uh, for all nu and S. Um, but it's also isotropic. And here's where the way we chose S comes in. Also isotropic uh, for all and nu not in S because, well, even if you throw out the T part, it's still isotropic. That was the definition of S. So for a mu not in S, even this part is isotropic. So you have a non-trivial zero here. So you can just make the first variable equal zero and you find that, oh, sorry, minus T. Um, uh, you find that this one is isotropic too. Okay. Um, and now by induction, so, or the N equals four case in this case, uh, we get that minus T A1, B1, C1, uh, is isotropic over Q. So that tells you that T is also represented by A1Z squared plus B1W squared plus C1V squared. 
And since we argued already with weak approximation that T was represented by the first half of the quadratic form, um, then we get that, well, so we get the, with our X and Y's that AX squared plus BY squared uh, can be made equal to A1 Z squared plus B1 W squared plus T1 B squared. And that gives us our global solution, our solution in the rational numbers. Um, okay. Right. The the what's the last part of the previous page? The last part of the previous page? Yeah, you just moved it. Yeah. Yes. Because uh, a one b one c one what? Uh, because a one b one c one is is isotropic. So since this is isotropic, there's a zero, a non-trivial zero here. Well, then you just add a variable. You have an, you've added a variable to that. You can just set that variable equal to zero, and you get a non-trivial zero there. So is that over q nu or in over q? Yeah, yes, yes, over q nu. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I didn't write that. Thank you. Yeah. But, and it'll be too cramped if I write it now. Okay. All right. So that was the Hassan Minkowski theorem. Um, and now let's well, again wipe the slate clean. So, and start over. Start. I don't want to say start the course over, but let's start a new topic, which is uh, integral quadratic forms. Or quadratic forms over Z. So let me start by recalling the definition of a quadratic space over a field. So um, a quadratic space was always was a pair of v comma f. So where this is a finite dimensional vector space. And, um, and f was a function from v, uh, so let's call the field k, uh, was a function from v to k such that, uh, well, first property is it should be homogeneous of degree two. So if you take f of lambda v, it's the same as you can, you pull out a lambda squared. And the second property was that uh, if you define the pairing of v and w to be uh, f of v plus w minus f of v minus f of w, uh, this should be linear each variable. Um, that's kind of abstract, uh, but it's equivalent to saying that if uh, if you write if you choose a basis of v um, and then write uh, f in terms of the coefficients. Uh, let's call them x1 dot 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 xn, uh, then uh, oops, I was, should I call it capital F? Maybe it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, then F is a, a homogeneous polynomial. Of degree two. Um, so this quadratic space thing, it's just a, just kind of a, a coordinate free way of talking about homogeneous polynomials of degree two. And I'm gonna slightly prefer this, well, we'll, we'll, we'll use both perspectives, but for concreteness, I, I recommend you just think of a homogeneous polynomial of degree two. So for example, you know, so, well, if you're in two variables, then you just get something like this, ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared. So that's for two dimensional quadratic spaces. You know, once you choose coordinates, then you're just talking about such a, such a quadratic polynomial, homogeneous quadratic polynomial. Um, but the, the fact that we started with an abstract description tells us that we're gonna be mostly interested in studying uh, quadratic forms up to change of variables. So we would consider this quadratic form to be equivalent to or isomorphic to any other quadratic form you get by a linear change of variables, an invertible linear change of variables in the x and y. So this is this is the context we've been working uh, with uh, since the very start of Akhil's lectures. Um, now what about over z? 
Um, well, we can actually just do the same definition. The only real question is what the analog of a finite dimensional vector space is. Um, so, and it's, so you, you know that every, every, you know, yeah, well, the correct analog of a finite dimensional vector space over Z is just a, a finite free Z module. So uh, it's a pair of M comma F where M is a, a Z module or an abelian group, which has a basis. So which is isomorphic to uh, Z to the Z direct sum N for some N. So we just explicitly require that our abelian group is a free abelian group of finite rank. And then we think it's analogous to a, a finite dimensional vector space or the closest we can possibly come you know, to a finite dimensional vector space. Um, and F is as before. And again, there's nothing in the uh, equivalence between these two perspectives, which really used that it was a field. Um, so it's the same thing as a homogeneous degree two polynomial. Uh, with integer coefficients. So before it was coefficients A, B, C in the field. Um, now it's coefficients lying in the ring of integers. Um, so, so far it doesn't seem uh, that different, um, but uh, well, I mean, I'm gonna make a series of remarks which will lead to a picture that actually there are quite a few differences um, between the theory over Z and the theory over fields. So first remark is that Akhil had this standing convention that a quadratic space is always non-degenerate. So before, uh, we said our quadratic spaces or quadratic forms should be non-degenerate. Or in other words, this, this, this associated pairing, um, so V cross V to the field or Z or whatever, uh, should be a perfect pairing. So it induces an isomorphism of, oh, sorry, I, maybe I'm switching my M's and yeah. Um, uh, we're gonna drop this assumption now. Why? Well, our favorite examples are, are, non, are, are degenerate. <laughs> it, it's not satisfied. Uh, you know in our favorite examples. There are just too few for our purposes, uh, yeah, non-degenerate quadratic forms. So for example, uh, one of the most famous and well-studied quadratic forms is also one of the simplest to write down. F of x, y is x squared plus y squared. Um, and there are a lot of, you know, there's some cool theorems in number theory about this. So for example, and these are the kinds of theorems we're going to be talking about. Uh, an odd prime p is represented by x squared plus y squared if and only if uh, p is congruent to one mod four. So that's a very, very fun fact in number theory. Um, and do you want to be able, I mean, these are the kinds of theorems we're going to be talking about right now. Uh, questions about representing numbers and in particular prime numbers by quadratic forms and to get you know interesting examples, you have to allow uh, non. You have to allow degenerate. They're not really degenerate because they're non-degenerate over the rational numbers. So they're really just, yeah. They're not perfect. I mean, they're not it, the the word for it. They, they the number theorists use in this context is unimodular. I suppose so. The associated lattice is unimodular. It just doesn't happen often enough. Um, right. So that's one difference. We're dropping this non-degeneracy assumption. Um, by the way, how, so we had this, so how do you check non-degeneracy? So uh, recall over a field, uh, non-degenerate was the same thing as saying that the determinant of the matrix, <clears throat> or the, you know, the determinant of the bilinear form uh, is invertible, is in you know, K cross. Um, 
So you you know you in terms of a basis you can write out um in terms of a basis for your finite dimensional vector space you get a square matrix by just plugging in the different possible values of your um, bilinear form on the basis vectors and if the determinant if that's an invertible matrix then uh, your perfect pairing is non-degenerate and that's actually an if and only if this is also true over over z but so in other words it's if and only if the determinant of the matrix you get. Um, now you don't want to say it's non-zero. What you want to say is that it's a unit. Um, so, but now the difference between the integers in a field is that, that the integers. Well, one of the one of the differences between the integers in a field is that there are very few units in the ring of integers. So this is just plus or minus one, right? So to get an, a non-degenerate one, you have to have this property that the determinant of the matrix you write down from the quadratic form actually has the determinant plus or minus one, not non-zero, but plus or minus one. Um, so for example, um, if you look at the matrix for uh, fxy equals x squared plus y squared, uh, you're, you actually get, uh, I think, two, two, zero, zero. No, no, uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's right, two, zero, zero, two. And that means the determinant is equal to four. Um, so yeah. But uh, but this the fact that the units are so small also gives us something nice. So recall also. So that de this determinant um, depends on the basis of the vector space. but only up to squares, only up to squares of units. So recall that when you do a change of basis on your quadratic form, an isomorphism on your quadratic form, if M is the matrix for the quadratic form and A is the change of basis, then the matrix for the new guy is A, M, A transpose. So when you take determinant, you see the square of the determinant of A multiplied by the determinant of M. So again, all of this just works in fact over an arbitrary commutative ring and in particular over the integers. So now, but now we learned that over Z, uh, the determinant of our quadratic form is independent of the basis. And this is because well, if you take the square of any unit, you get one. So nothing's really changing. So that's that's nice. So we don't have to remember that the determinant is a coset anymore. It's really a or determinant or discriminant. I don't know. There's some sign, right? Um, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, um, yeah, it's well defined on the nose. So it's just an integer. Um, okay. So now, uh, right. I'm going to now specialize to uh, there's a lot to say about the general theory of uh, integer quadratic forms, but I think it's a nice idea to just specialize to the first non trivial case because you see a lot, well there's some special phenomena which help you, which is you know which make the discussion easier, but you see also a lot of the general phenomena that appear in the general theory. So we'll specialize to the first non-trivial case. So this is uh, two variables, also known as binary quadratic forms, which is a weird word, but it must be some old fashioned thing that stuck. Binary, I guess, means, stands for two variables. I don't know. Um, so, um, so right. And so again, that just means that in coordinates, uh, we have fxy is equal to ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared, and a and b and c are the integers. And uh, if you calculate the matrix, uh, uh, for the, the associated bilinear pairing, um, I think I'm not going to go through this, but uh, you get uh, 2a, 2c, b, b. So you're always going to get two times on the diagonals, and then it's always going to be a symmetric matrix. And in fact, 
you can go backwards. If you have a symmetric matrix where the diagonal entries are even, you can write down an associated quadratic form from which it comes. Um, but anyway, I just want to remark right now that the determinant is equal to, uh, well, some familiar quantity. Uh, uh, well, I'll write minus the determinant is equal to b squared minus 4ac. You're all old familiar discriminant from, uh, from you know, uh, high school, right? Uh, so let's call, let's call this the discriminant. So does this match your sign convention you had to kill? In this case, the discriminant should be minus the determinant. Do you remember? Oh, I think, uh, yes, yes, right. Oh, that's good, because I want this. It would be, I mean, b squared minus 4ac, that's got to be the discriminant, right? And <laughs> you, don't, you don't want it to be minus the discriminant. That would be confusing. Um, yeah. So, yes. Um, now, there are two, there's a fundamental dichotomy. Whoops. So what well, we're going to throw out discriminant equals to zero. That's going to be too degenerate for us. So um, there's d positive and d negative. Oh, so, uh, yes, right. D positive and d negative, um, which is which can be read off. I mean, the discriminant you can the discriminant is defined for an integer quadratic form. But if you you know go, when you have an integer quadratic form, you get a quadratic form over an arbitrary field. Right, because any field you like, you can do this. You know, these are integer coefficients, so they make sense in any commutative ring, hence in any field. So you could just view it there. So if you have any invariance for any quadratic field, of, uh, quadratic form over any field, you get an invariant for quadratic forms over z, right? Um, and the discriminant, so in, in particular, and the discriminant doesn't change because it's just the same matrix. So we can always, well, um, we can look over the real numbers and we have a two variable quadratic form and we have this Sylvester's law of inertia, which says that it's isomorphism type is recorded by just which signs you have on the diagonal, right? So pluses or minuses and the determinant greater than zero that corresponds to the case where you have a plus and a minus, um, which, uh, which means that this is indefinite. Uh, that's what, that's just the definition of indefinite that it, over the reals you have pluses and minuses, both pluses and minuses, but it means that, um, well, uh, yeah, F takes both positive and negative values. And if the, dis the uh, discriminant is negative, this means this is the same thing as saying that uh, you're over the reals are definite. And that's the same thing as saying that uh, F's values, I mean, non zero values are always either positive zero or greater than greater than zero a uh, greater than zero or less than zero so um and we can choose in the second case in this case here we can arrange uh all values to be positive by changing f by a sign so we just replace f by minus f and we switch between these two cases now those f and minus f are not isomorphic, right? They can't be because they take different values, but it's clear that the study of one will easily reduce to the study of the other. Um, so, um, so if we're gonna, we're, so what, what I'm trying to say is we're gonna focus on this case. This is the simplest case for a reason I'll explain in just a second. And we're also going to just or change the sign of f to make it so-called positive definite. Uh, instead of negative definite. Um, so why is, <clears throat> so I'll give, I want to give you a hint of the arithmetic significance of this dichotomy. We're not going to prove this, um, but it'll be in the background for this distinction. So you can also read this off. Um, so if D is greater than zero, it turns out the orthogonal group uh, of our quadratic form uh, is a finite group. Whereas if D is less than zero, uh, it's infinite. Well, I guess I'm saying the same thing twice because I put the, you know, the reverse implications too, but yeah. Um, well, actually you'll see, you'll prove this on your, your problem set. In fact, a, a generalization of this um, to, um, to uh, 
quadratic, you know, arbitrary number with, with an arbitrary number of variables. This is a little more subtle to prove, but you'll do a, you'll, you'll do it in one case at least. I want you to study a particular indefinite quadratic form uh, and find its um, orthogonal group. Um, it's a good exercise in number theory. Um, and this is basically the reason why we're uh, ignoring the indefinite case because, um, oh shoot, did I do it backwards? Ah, sorry, 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 sorry. Yes, in the definite case, it's finite. In the indefinite case, uh, it's infinite. I'm sorry. Yeah, we're sticking to the definite case because it's much simpler to have a finite group of automorphisms. In fact, it's going to be very, very small. You can, you can yeah, it won't be very big at all. It's not uh, finite. It's also easy to determine. It's almost always just of order two, uh, or order four, I guess. I don't know. Um, and um, yeah, right. Uh, having an infinite group of automorphisms makes things a little more complicated. Um, okay, uh, right. Ah, there's one more thing I want to mention, which is another change in conventions that takes place when you move to the integers. Um, so this is a little obscure at first sight, but- um, I'm sorry, can you define order, please? This is order? Or what's that O sub F? Uh, this is the uh, orthogonal group of the quadratic form. This, I think this notation was used by Akhil. I hope I, uh, um, but yeah, what it means is it's the automorphisms of the quadratic form. So it's those linear change of variables which leave the form invariant, so which don't change the form. So for example, if we look at x squared plus y squared, if we replace x by minus x, it doesn't change the quadratic form. So that would be in the orthogonal group, that linear change of variables. We're, if we switch x and y, it doesn't change the quadratic form. Um, but if we replace x comma y by x plus y comma x, that's also an invertible change of variables that will change the quadratic form. So that will not be in the orthogonal group. That will be an isomorphism between this quadratic form and another quadratic form. Thank you. You're welcome. So when we work over z, it's a good idea to use a finer form of equivalence than isomorphism. So it's called strict isomorphism or strict equivalence. This will mean that they can be that uh, F and G are related by an invertible linear change of variables uh, excuse me an invertible linear change of variables so far i've just said the definition of isomorphism right but now i'm going to add another condition with determinant 1 so you're kind of throwing away half the possible changes of variables. You want to require them to be determinant one. Um, the reason for this is not obvious at first sight. Well, it certainly gives us more information. So a priori, it's a good idea to do it. Uh, quadratic forms up to this equivalence is finer. So you're, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're potentially seeing more, right? So, that, but it turns out that many of the results are much nicer to state uh, when you use this finer notion of equivalence. Um, than if you use the coarse one. They become, statements become much more uniform. And you can understand how to go from the fine one to the coarse one. And you can see, once, you, once we develop the theory, you can see exactly why, um, what's causing the fact that you get more uniform results with this notion of equivalence versus the other notion of equivalence. Um, right. Um, so I think, uh, so this was just setting the stage and I think I'll, maybe I'll stop for now. Uh, and we'll actually get to some results, uh, some non-trivial theorems and results in the in the next lecture. Um, yeah, but maybe I should say, you know, it's not, you know, how, how would you do that? We had this nice abstract notion of a quadratic space. So what is that? This is a concrete thing with polynomials being related by changes of variables. Um, you can make it into an abstract thing by saying that a quadratic space, by talking about an oriented quadratic space. So like a finite free Z module with a quadratic form on it to, and an orientation. So uh, an orientation, you could define, yeah, or an orientation on the real vector space you get from that. 
freezing module of rank two anyway. So there is a there is an abstract perspective on this too. I'm just going to stick to the concrete one. Um, yes. So, any questions? Uh, maybe I should actually say one more thing because I didn't get quite as far as I thought I would. So there are a couple of problems on the problem set that. Well, I guess there. I guess you can still do them. Um, yeah, you can still do them. You just don't have the context for the discussion. So you doing them will then make you uh, better appreciate the context, which is coming in the next lecture. Let's, let's put it that way. Yeah, so problems three and four, I thought I was going to be giving a little bit of context for, but it doesn't make it any easier to solve it to have the context. But um, yeah. Uh, OK, so fine. Yes, Sundara, exactly. A, a basis, um, a, a matrix belonging to GLNZ. Yep. So an invertible matrix with integer coefficients. Invertible in the sense of matrices. You can find them. Yeah. That's the same thing as having determinant plus or minus one. And now I've just excluded determinant minus one for the strict equivalence. Yes, Kenta. Hey, uh, quick question. Is there an explicit example of things that are, are two forms that are isomorphic but not strict or isomorphic but not strictly isomorphic yes um it's not so easy to say right off the top of my head because you do need to go to pretty high discriminant uh i think the lowest discriminant for which it happens is uh is is um minus 23 um so we'll have better it's a good question. It's not obvious. Uh, we'll have a better context for it um, after the next few lectures, and then I'll be able to give an example. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, Eleutherius. So over, well, over Z, if we consider the, the quadratic form of X squared plus Y squared, this, this binary quadratic form, if we write the the matrix, then it's two times the identity, if, if I'm not mistaken, yes. which would mean that the determinant of that would be equal to, to four, which is not in, in Z star, which is not in plus minus one. So would that mean that this form is degenerate over Z? Well, I would hesitate to use the word degenerate, um, but it means that it's not a, the world that people, people use when working over Z is, is unimodular. So it's not unimodular. I mean, it's not real. I wouldn't really call it degenerate because you're never going to have like, because over the rational numbers, it's, you know, it's not degenerate. So it doesn't really feel degenerate. I mean, it doesn't, um, but it's not quite a perfect pairing. So I think one should come up with a new word. I mean, they unimodular, but then that, that only really works over a Z. So I don't know. Um, I don't think it's a good idea to call it degenerate, but what it means is that, you know, it's not, you don't get an isomorphism from the, the finite free Z module to its dual, you get something which differs from an isomorphism. You know, it's off by some finite amount in some sense. It's a, it's an injection with a finite co-kernel, you could say, yeah. I see, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I had a question. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, so is there a relation between the orthogonal group um, of the quadratic form uh, over the integers and the unit group of the corresponding um, quadratic field? Because we see that there are a similar phenomenon happens um, with the units that um, in the real quadratic fields, for instance, the units are generally infinite. Yes, indeed, there is. Imaginary quadratic fields, the units are finite. Indeed, it's um. We're gonna see. <clears throat> we're gonna see yes. that these facts are indeed very closely related. Yes. I see. So 
So just a spoiler alert, we're going to see that a, a source of quadratic forms is ideals in uh, rings of integers in quadratic fields. So for every ideal in the ring of integers, we're going to do, introduce all these concepts, yeah, but for every ideal in a ring of integers in a real quadratic field, you can write down a quadratic form. And um, if you have an isomorphism, and then if you have any unit, you can act by it and you get a um, you get an automorphism. Um, yeah. Well, sorry, I mean, you have to exclude, in the real quadratic case, it's not as simple, which is another re reason for excluding that. But in the imaginary quadratic case, yes, every unit gives an isomorphism of the corresponding quadratic space. And so you at least get an injection from uh, the units um, in the ring of integers of the quadratic field to uh, to the orthogonal group of the quadratic space. Yeah. Oh no, maybe uh, maybe there is no subtlety in the real quadratic case. Uh, we'll see when we get there. <laughs> um, yeah. Excellent question, Sundara. So Sundara asks, for quadratic forms over Q, we have a theorem like Haas and Minkowski. Over Z, do we have such an analog? The answer is no. So, and in fact, one of the problems on your problem set is going to be, yeah, I'll give you two quadratic, integer quadratic forms, and I'm asking you to prove they're isomorphic over ZP for all P and over R, uh, but they're not isomorphic over Z. And this is, so, We'll, we'll talk a bit more about this phenomenon in the next lecture. It's not an easy problem, I don't think. Uh, I'm curious to see how you guys attack it. Yes, Eleferios. So just looking back at the the Hasse minkowski theorem, would it, would it, wouldn't it follow from this theorem that if I have, because I think I've read this theorem somewhere and I just want to see if I remember it correctly, that if I have a, a, a quadratic form over the rational numbers that has dimension at least five and is indefinite, then that would be isotropic, right? Yes, that's because right. Because the indefinite gives me the isotropy in R by Sylvester and the dimension five and above gives me the isotropy in QP by the U invariant. Correct. So then I go to global by Hasse Minkowski. Yes, that's a nice corollary of the Hasse Minkowski theorem, yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah. I see, thank you. You're welcome. Hey, sorry, uh, what was the statement of the corollary? Uh, it, well, Eleftherios, would you mind repeating yourself? Uh, yeah, that, that's fine. So the, the, corolla the corollary of the, the Hasse-Minkowski theorem would be this. So suppose I have a, a quadratic form over Q, and I know that it is indefinite in the sense that, uh, I mean, basically in, in the sense that it represents both positive and negative values. So similar to the usual sense in, in the real numbers. So I know it is indefinite and its dimension is at least equal to five. It's five or above. And then it would follow from, from Hasse Minkowski that this form is actually isotropic because the indefiniteness makes it isotropic over the reals and the dimension being five or above makes it isotropic over QP for every P by this U invariant equal to four. Therefore, by Hasse Minkowski, I go from local to global, and it's isotropic over over the the rationals. Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. This observation, in fact, proves uh, I think uh, Lagrange's standard theorem, right? Every number. So we just uh, take this positive number on the other side, and we can using this observation. 
Telegram is there that every cost is there. Oh, really? Well, I didn't know I, that. I was thinking because, uh, so uh, let us take this four dimensional form one, 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 and yeah. then we take this n minus n. Yeah. So uh, using Hilaf-Thirio's argument, we get a rational solution for this. Yep. Uh, but then, will that prove Lagrange? It proves the, the form of Lagrange's theorem, at least for, you know, where you allow rational numbers. But I don't know a priori. Uh, I think a priori, it's a different question. The, representing n by square, sums of squares of rational numbers or by sums of squares of integers. Um, it's, it, it's probably worth thinking about, but yeah, I, at the moment I don't see an argument for going from one to the other, but that's still, that's an interesting line of thought. Um, yes, hello, there is. Uh, in the beginning of the course, I remember that Professor Matthew started his, his first lecture presenting some theorems on on sums of squares. I mean, mainly for for integers. Like there's, I mean, for like sums of two, three, and and eventually four squares. Uh, are we going to be ending up proving some or all of those? Well, I, I don't actually at the moment. I don't remember which theorems Akhil stated, but like for example, Lagrange theorem for like every uh, natural number sum of four squares. I, for now, we're going to be sticking with two variables, so we won't be talking about Lagrange's theorem. Yeah, that's fair. I yeah. see. Thanks. Um, yeah. Okay, I might. I'll, I might say we're going to give. A, a, we're going to do stud, study x squared plus y squared, right? At the very least, and then remind me at that point, and I'll tell you how to modify it to handle x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus w squared. I mean, sorry, I guess I thought that Sarah, I mean, in the course in arithmetic book, he does deduce like Lagrange's theorem and uh, these various theorems um, for, for sums of four squares and also three squares. Um, but I guess, yeah, I'm forgetting a little bit. Uh, yeah, there is some extra argument needed to go from a rational solution to an integral solution. But, it, but the argument exists, eh? The argument exists. Uh, yeah. Interesting. So uh, there's so much stuff in this Sarah book. I mean, God. oh, here's that, oh yeah, appendix. Yeah, here we go. Um, oh, there's a lemma of Davenport and Castles. Okay. Huh, all right. I see, okay, that's interesting. Well, um, people always say Sarah's a really good writer. I don't know. I always find it really difficult to read this book, but uh, <laughs> it's also jam packed, you know, and it feels kind of, some of the arguments feel kind of convoluted with their many references. Um, but it, so, yeah, but there is this section in this book. So I just, I just found it. Um, so it's on page in the edition I have, at least it's on page 46. There's a lemma, lemma B attributed to Davenport castles that allows you to go from Q to Z in the case at hand. Um, so uh, I will refer you to the book with my sympathies for how difficult reading it actually is. Um, yeah, but I guess it looks like, yeah, it's something special to, uh, it's, it, there is this condition that you have to impose on the quadratic form. Um, I mean, this condition that he um, puts in parentheses H and then that lets, and under that condition, which applies to sums of, sums of three squares and I guess sums of four squares, um, or at least some three squares. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it, you can go from an integral, uh, the rational solution to an integral solution. Oh, yeah, so it's still from, yeah, so for four squares, he reduces to three squares by some more, by some elementary mod eight considerations. Well, anyway, okay. So yeah, there's some tricks, yeah. And then uh, Sundara, your, your proposal does work out after some tricks. Yeah.
And again, everybody, please do feel free to correct me if I'm mispronouncing your name. I, um, a lot of, yeah, a lot of your names are unfamiliar to me, but uh, I'm happy to learn. Any more questions? Okay, well then I'll, I'll see you in a couple hours or however, yeah. See you when the time comes. Good luck with the problem set and have fun the rest of the day.